Sandy has been married before, and so, you know, I really envy her having had that experience, but um, we both believe that there would be a settling in and a, and a, and a, and a deepening of our, our commitment if we could get through this instead of feeling instead like it's everybody else's decision. Did you, um, in prior to the filing of this lawsuit, seek a marriage license? Yes. What happened? Describe that. We went to the Alameda County Recorder's Office in May, at having reached the point where we wanted to see if there was a permanent solution to this problem, and wanted to know in a more concrete way whether how Prop 8 was being enacted. And we indeed pulled a number, filled out a form, and waited for our turn. And the clerk uh, that day, uh, we sat down in front of her, and she opened up her computer and looked at the form we were trying to get. And she, her eyes got really big, and she looked at us, and she said, I am sorry, but there are reasons why I don't think I can do what you're asking me to do, but I'm not comfortable not doing it. So I'm going to go get my boss. He's going to have to do it. So she left the, 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 the cubicle, and she went upstairs, and there was a long delay, and she came downstairs with her supervisor, and he had written down this Prop 8, the statute, I think, and he read from it, and he was very nervous and very upset, and ve I'm sure worried that we would be upset as well, which we were, and he said, after reading the statute, I'm very sorry that I cannot give you this license, but I hope someday I can, and I hope you'll come back. Thought about the impact upon you of you and Sandy and your relationship of bringing a lawsuit and being a plaintiff in a civil rights case, and what's that like? I've been thinking about it a lot lately, <laughs> and to be, well, Sandy and I really like our life where we, we live in our house and we see our kids and we see our friends. And we don't want anything to change about our life. In fact, we would really like our life to just get better and better. And when I think about whether or not what we want to have happen would make it possible for other people to have that happen, that makes me really happy. But it, 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 it most importantly comes from a place of just wanting our lives to feel better than they do right now. If the courts of the United States were ultimately decided that you and other same persons seeking to marry someone of the same sex could indeed, did indeed have the constitutional right to get married, do you think that that would have an effect on other acts of discrimination against you? Objection. Speculation. Close, but uh, objection overruled. State of mind. You may answer. I believe, for me, personally, as a lesbian, that if I had grown up in a world where the most important decision I was going to make as an adult was treated the same way as everybody else's decision, that I would not have been treated the way I was growing up or as an adult. There's something so humiliating about everybody knowing that you want to make that decision and you don't get to that you know, it's hard to face the people at work and the, and the people even here right now, and, and it, many of you have this, but I don't, so I have to still find a way to feel okay and not take every bit of discriminatory behavior toward me too personally because in the end that would only hurt me and my family. So if Prop 8 were undone and kids like me growing up in Bakersfield right now could could never know what this felt like that I assume that their entire lives would be on a higher arc 
and they would live with a higher sense of themselves that would improve the quality of their entire life. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Very well. You may cross-examine. Mr. Rom, is it? No questions. Well, and, uh, Ms. Perry, you may step down. Mr. <clears throat> Olson, your next witness. Thank you. The Plaintiffs would like to call Plaintiff Sandra Steer. Sandra Belzer Steer. S T I E R. S A N D R A. Ms. Steer, are you a, one of the plaintiffs in this lawsuit? Yes, I am. Would you describe for us um, for, and for the court your background, where, where you are from, um, your age, what you do um, professionally? and your family? Um, well, I, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up on a farm in southern Iowa. Um, I'm 47 years old. Um, my background is really, I lived in Iowa for my, my youth. I grew up going to public schools, attended college in Iowa, and moved to California right after college. And I now work um, for Alameda, or for a county government as an information system director in healthcare systems. And. Do you, you live with Ms. Perry? I do. And tell us about your family. Well, our family is um, a blended family with our, our four boys. We each bring two biological children to our family and each other. And they're just their general ages? Well, our two younger sons are in high school. They're teenagers. And our two older sons are out of high school, young adults. How would you describe your sexual orientation? I'm gay. When did you learn that about yourself? I really learned it about myself fairly late in life, in my mid-30s. When, had you been married before at that time? Yes, I was married before. Uh, were you married to a man? Yes, I was. When did you get married and where did you live? I got married in 1987. And we lived um, most, of the, most of that marriage in Alameda, California. And you had no feeling at that point in time married to a man that you were a lesbian? At that time, I did not. Um, and did you have a warm, loving relationship with that individual? Um, I had, a, unfortunately, a difficult relationship for most of our marriage, but it did start out with the best intentions. Well, did you encounter um, gay people uh, growing up in Iowa. I'm wondering how this evolved, this, this, your, the, your realization of how you characterize yourself these days. Tell us how that evolved from your youth in Iowa. Well, growing up in Iowa on, on a farm in the country where this, you know, the, the small town that I went to high school and had 1,500 people and the towns around us were fairly similar, I really had a fairly sheltered upbringing, a good upbringing, but um, sheltered. We spent most of our time at our home, you know, working with my parents. Uh, we didn't really travel and go to any place that was very different from where I grew up. Uh, and I did not know any gay people. I didn't even know of gay people or really even the concept of a gay lifestyle or, or sexuality um, until I was like a teenager. And then, so you, tell us when you moved to California. I moved to California in 1985 when I graduated. And, and you married in Iowa before you came to California, or were you married uh, after you came to California? I moved here in 1985 and got married in 1987, so that was in California. Husband in California? Yes, I did. 
Well, that, tell us about that. Did you have um, a relationship with him for a certain period of time before you got married? Uh, yes, I did. We dated for uh, about a year before we got married. And give us the date again of, your, of the marriage. November 14th, 1987. 87. And when did the marriage come to an end? Uh, the marriage came to an end in 1999. When did you meet um, Ms. Perry? Um, I met Chris around 1996. When and how did your relationship with her develop? Um, and, and, and go ahead. Well, when I first met Chris, um, I, of course, I hadn't known her previously. I was teaching a computer class, and she was a student in my class. Um, and so I just sort of knew of her. Uh, but then we started working together on projects at work and ended up being co-workers and became fast friends quite quickly. Um, and we were friends for quite some time, and I began to realize that uh, the feelings I had for her were really unique and different from nor friends, from feelings I normally have towards friends. Um, and they were absolutely taking over my thoughts and my, um, sort of my entire self, and I grew to realize I had a very strong attraction to her, and indeed I was falling in love with her. When, and tell us when you realized finally that you had fallen in love with her. Uh, I really, I realized that in 1999, early in the year. Did your falling in love with Chris have anything to do with the dissolution of your marriage? My marriage was troubled on many fronts um, and had been in uh, a very, very, very difficult state. And the end of my marriage was precipitated by my own extreme unhappiness, um, my ex-husband's um, severe problems with alcohol and his inability to provide the type of support as a husband and a family person that I, I had to have. Did your sexual orientation or your discovery of your sexual orientation have anything to do with the dissolution of that marriage? No, it did not. Your husband's no longer living, is that correct? That's true. Um, well, then tell us about how your relationship with Ms. Perry developed. Well, my relationship with Chris, um, it's, uh, it's the romantic part of our relationship certainly started um, for me in a while, just a very exciting place. I I've, had never experienced falling in love before. And I think... You're, are you saying that you weren't in, in love with your husband? I was not in love with my husband, no. Did you think that you were at some point? I... I had a hard time relating to the concept of, fall, of being in love when I was married to my husband. And while I, I did love him when I married him, I honestly just couldn't relate when people said they were in love. I thought they were overstating their feelings and maybe making a really big deal out of something. It didn't really make sense to me. It seemed dramatic. Um, and when I grew up, I you know, when you grow up in the Midwest and in, the, in, in, in a farming family, which is a really unique way to grow up if anybody knows much about that. But um, there's a pragmatism that is inherent and it's part of the fabric of life and an understated way of being that is just pervasive in terms of your, your development. And I remember as a young girl um, talking to my mom about love and marriage and she would say, you know, marriage is more than romantic love, and it's more than excitement. It's, it's an enduring long-term commitment, and it's hard work. And in my family, that seemed very true. <laughs> so I really thought that was what I was kind of signing up for when I got married, not that it would be bad, but that it would be hard work, and I would grow into that love, and um, that I needed to marry a good, solid person, and that I would grow into something like my parents had, which was a really a lovely marriage and still is. And then you're, you were in, I interrupted you, were in the midst of describing what happened in terms of your own feelings as your relationship with Ms. Perry developed. Well, with, with Chris, my rela so I, we have this wonderfully romantic relationship and um, that just really grew and, and blossomed very beautifully and uh, not only were we in love, but we wanted, we realized, you know, fairly soon that we wanted to build a life together. We wanted to join our families and, and live as a family that we didn't want to date. Um, and I was 36 or 37 years old. We, 
and Chris is tiny bit younger than me, um, but we really wanted to build a family together and have that kind of life of, of commitment and stability that we both really appreciated. Well, how convinced are you that you are gay? You, you lived with a husband, you said you loved him. Um, some people might say, well, it's this and then it's that and then mm. it could be this again. What, answer that. Uh, well, I'm convinced because at 47 years old, I've fallen in love one time and it's with Chris. And uh, our love is, it's, it's a blend of many things. It's physical attraction, it's romantic attraction, it's uh, a strong commitment, it's an intellectual bonding and an emotional bonding. It's, for me, if this isn't love, I really, quite frankly, don't know what that would be for, for adults. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. Why are you a plaintiff in this case? Well, I'm a plaintiff in this case because I would like to get married, and I would like to marry the person that I choose, and that is Chris Perry. She's a woman, and according to California law right now, we can't get married, and I want to get married. I did hear the description of before of the experience you went through in that summer of 2004, the spring and summer of 2004, where you came to San Francisco, thought you had gotten married, had a ceremony in Berkeley, thought that that was a celebration of your marriage, and then found out you weren't married. Correct. What, what feelings did you have um, during that period of time? Uh, well, I, I've, when we found out, we, well, during that period of time, you know, we were planning our wedding in 2004, um, and then when we had the opportunity to get married in San Francisco, we were really excited because we didn't expect that to even happen. So we did it. It was a great day, and it made planning our August wedding all the more fun because we were planning a celebration of something that had been formalized and legalized in San Francisco. Um, so it just added this amazingly wonderful dimension to our, our wedding. Um, so August first was a, a terrific day for us and we loved it and our family and friends were there and one of our kids gave this amazing toast um, he said uh, Chris and Sandy are perfect for each other and this couldn't have turned out any better and I thought yeah you know I rock on I couldn't believe I couldn't agree with you more um, shortly thereafter though we did find out that our marriage was invalidated and we received a document from the, the, the city that Chris described earlier um, saying that it was invalidated. And I, I felt so outraged and, um, and hurt by that and humiliated. And I felt like everybody who had come to our wedding and gone out of their way and brought us lovely gifts and celebrated with us must feel a level of humiliation themselves too. And it made me feel like there were people in the world that are the dearest and nearest to me that probably felt a certain level of pity for us. And the last thing I've ever wanted to do is invoke those feelings of pity on us for something especially as beautiful as our marriage. Well, when the California Supreme Court subsequently in May of 2008 said you had a constitutional right to get married, how did you feel about that? I felt great that the court thought we had, felt we had a constitutional right to get married. That was exciting. It was also cloaked, though, in this uh, dissension that felt very familiar. What do you mean, dissension? Well, the dissension that was sort of the political brewing of, uh, of some activist groups that disagreed with gay marriage, wanting to put something together to invalidate that court decision. You mean you were aware of that at the time? I, I was aware of reading in the paper about, um, about that. Well, did you consider, well, the California Supreme Court has said that we can get married, we want to get married, we tried it once before, now we're told we have a constitutional right to do it, let's do it. We thought about it and discussed it, and I, I really felt very strongly that um, at, at my age, I, I don't want to be humiliated anymore, it's, it's not okay. Uh, we did get married, in fact we got married twice, and we could get married a third time, and it could get taken away, and then we get married a fourth time, and it for me, it felt like it made a circus out of our lives, and I don't want to be party to that. Um, I told Chris, I want to marry you in the worst way, and, but I want it to be permanent, and I don't want any possibility of it being taken away from us. So let's wait until we know for sure that we can be permanently married. We didn't want to do 
it for any, for any other reason. And we did have friends that got married and we were proud of them and thrilled for them and also worried for them that they would have the same experience that we had had. Tell me all the ways that, well, let me go, withdraw that for a moment um, and ask you about domestic partnership. You and Chris entered into a domestic partnership. Um, explain to the court in your words why you did that and what that relationship means to you compared to what you're seeking here today. Uh, okay, well, first of all, for me, there is, domestic partnership doesn't indicate anything about a relationship, so it's hard for me to put it in those terms. It feels like a, it's a legal agreement between two parties that spell out um, responsibilities and duties, like fiduciary duties that you have towards each other, and those duties are uh, mirror some of those similar types of duties that are, of course, found in marriage. Um, but domestic partnership... Uh, to me, and certainly the way that we entered it, it was really very much part of estate planning, and it was based upon legal advice that we had gotten just to make sure that our affairs were tightly in order, that our children had the maximum protection, and that Chris and I, uh, for each other, had the maximum legal protection that we could in, under California law. But there was certainly nothing about domestic partnership as an institution, um, not even an institution, but as a legal agreement that indicates the love and commitment that are inherent in marriage, and it, it doesn't have anything to do um, for us with the nature of our relationship and the type of, of enduring relationship we want it to be. It's just a legal document. Well, did the lawyer tell you that domestic um, partnership would give you virtually all the same legal rights vis-a-vis -vis your partner as marriage? I, I actually don't recall our lawyer saying that specifically, but she did say it's important that you file the domestic partnership agreement um, for your maximum protection. Well, if it did give you virtually all of the legal rights and so forth with respect to Ms. Perry, why wouldn't it be good enough? Because it has nothing to do with marriage. <laughs> nothing. Tell us what marriage then means to you? That's the second part of the question. What is it that's so special about that word and that relationship, that institution of marriage that means so much to you that you want it so badly that you'll bring this lawsuit? Well, marriage is about um, making a public commitment to the world, to your partner, to, to what I hope is someday my wife, um, to our friends, our family, uh, our society, our community, our parents. That's, it's just, to me, it's, it's the way we tell them and each other that this is a lifetime commitment. We're, it's not, we're not girlfriends, we're not partners, we're, we're married, we're, we're, we want, I want to have a spouse. It's, it just is, it's so different for domestic partnership and and I simply want that. And I, I have to say, having been married for 12 years and been in, in a domestic partnership for 10 years, it's different. It's not the same. I, I, want, I don't want to have to explain myself and have um, in a way that would indicate there must be something wrong with me. Or I wouldn't have to explain myself to anybody who has some reason they may need to know. Did you, did you misspeak? You said you'd been married for 12 years? I was, I was married for 12 years, yeah. From 1980s. Marriage was, the marriage was dissolved in 99? Correct, and it began in 1987. I see. All right. Well, I had misunderstood. Well, let me ask you this. <clears throat> if the state were to essentially get out of using the term marriage and admitting persons of the same sex or opposite sex into what it called a domestic union, a spousal relationship, whatever name you want to use, but not marriage. Wouldn't that put you on the same plane as others who have the same relationship, even though they are of opposite sex? I believe it would, because there wouldn't be anything different. Right now we're being treated differently, and if the state stopped, I guess, issuing marriage licenses and nobody else picked up the task, um, that could exclude us, then we would have the same access. And if we had the same access, I would feel like we were being treated equally. 
even though the term marriage was not used. Right, because then marriage wouldn't be something that anybody got to claim as a legal status. I guess you'd have to also look at the people who are already married and would they still have marriages. But if marriage were not a legal status sanctioned by the state or any type of government in our society, then I guess I wouldn't have to worry about not having access to it because nobody else would either said that you have to explain yourself, give, some, the, give the court some examples of things in everyday life, where you go, things that you do, where this relationship you have, you have to explain, um, or that it's awkward or humiliating, you know, whatever. Just give the court some examples. Well, there, there are a number of examples. It could be anything from going to um, our younger son's school and uh, having to pick them up for something and telling, you know, I'm, I consider myself to be their stepmother, um, and I do get Mother's Day cards, so I think that's, that's, they think the same thing of me, but if I pick them up, I have to explain who I am. I'm their stepmother, well, I'm the domestic partner of their mother, their, that's, you know, that's, this is who I am, this is why I'm picking them up. Um, or other familial terms, such as aunt uh, to a, a niece or a nephew. Um, but in, in other ways, just explaining who we are, the, the term domestic partner or partner isn't really that commonly known or understood by everybody. It's certainly probably understood by everybody in this courtroom and maybe people of a certain part of society or a generation, but it's, it's not common in, in the world. And it, even for those who know what the term means, it doesn't reflect our relationship in a way that feels authentic, uh, appropriately descriptive, in any way. We have a loving, committed relationship. We're not business partners. We're not social partners. We're not glorified roommates. We are, we, we're married. We want to be married. It's a different relationship. Are there occasions where you have to fill out forms that ask whether you're married or, or name of spouse or things like that? Uh, frequently. Uh, we've, I've encountered forms at school where there you have to say who, you know, Mother, who is the mother, who's the father? There's never a, a place there for, you know, instead of parent one, parent two even, or something different. Um, doctor's offices, are you single, or are you married, or are you, you know, divorced even? But, you know, so I often find myself, you know, scratching something out, putting a line through it, and saying domestic partner, and then having to make sure I explain to folks what that is to make sure that our transaction can go smoothly. Would, would being married um, have anything, would it provide you with any sense of security or stability that domestic partnership does not? It would, it really would. It, it would provide me with a sense of um, inclusion in the social fabric that of, uh, of the society I live in that um, I want to have. And it would make, I think I would feel more respected by other people and I feel like our relationship is more respected and and that I could hold my head up high as in our family and just that our family could feel proud and I want our children to feel proud of us I don't want them to feel worried about us or in any way that our like our family isn't good enough when the campaign occurred between the time uh, in May of 2008 when the California Supreme Court gave you a constitutional right or announced that you had a constitutional right, and November, when the voters took that away, um, how did, were you exposed to the election campaign in, in ways in your everyday life? I was. I, was, I certainly saw ads on television. Um, I saw bumper stickers on cars, signs in yard, you know, on front lawns. Um, I went to a rally. I was quite exposed to it at the rally where I went to, um, you know, just s support the no on eight, and, but there were, both sides were represented at the rally. Um, so yes, I was quite exposed. Did you hear things during that campaign in favor of Proposition 8 that were disturbing or upsetting to you? Many things, really everything. <laughs> for the yes on eight campaign was disturbing on some level and some more than others. Well, describe 
those emotions then. Um, what bothered you on one, one level and what bothered you on the other level? We need to the inform the court what it was like. Well, the, as I think folks probably remember, the, the campaign was very focused on protection, uh, protect marriage and protect children. Um, and with the subtle impl impl you know, uh, implication always that you need to be protected from gay marriage because it must be apparently bad or you wouldn't have to protect anybody from it. Um, I felt like the constant reference to children, it felt, it felt manipulative and it felt um, very harmful to me as an individual, to us as a, as a couple and our children, our family, our community. I felt like there was great harm being done and I felt like it was used to sort of try to educate people or convince people that there is some, a very a great evil to be, to be feared and that, that evil must be stopped. And that evil is us, I guess. Um, and, and as a mom of you know, four kids, I, I don't know if there's anything more inherent in parenting and, and stronger than the desire to protect your children. That's first and foremost, you protect your children. And the very notion that I be part of what others need to protect their children from, was, it was just, um, it was more than upsetting, it was, it was sickening, truly. I felt sickened by that campaign. As a parent of four children, um, you must have a strong sense of what a good parent ought to be. Um, you must have feelings about that. Uh, would your boys be better off with the man in the house? I think all children are, the, the best thing children can have is parents who love them. That's the most important thing. And I know I, I love my children with all my heart. Chris loves our children with all her heart. Um, and that's what I believe to be the best thing for them, to be loved. How do you feel about being a plaintiff in a case trying to change the Constitution? Is it a, a burden or is it, a, is it something that, um, that's easy for you uh, because of what it means? Tell us about that. Well, it's, uh, it doesn't feel like a burden. It just, I feel like a little tiny person in this huge gigantic, this huge country that just, I just want my, my rights. And I, I guess I keep focusing on the federal constitution more than the California constitution. So I think I'm not trying to change anything. I'm just trying to get the rights that the constitution already says I have. So I just want the same thing that I think I'm due and that I think everybody else is due as well. Well, let's tell, it, tell us now, if you are successful, how will it change your life? Being uh, given the right to marry and to be a part of lots and lots and lots of same-sex couples that will also be given that right. Why don't you rephrase that? Stop about midway. How would your life be different? Isn't that what you're asking? I couldn't phrase it better than you just did, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> right answer. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what it means to you as a plaintiff in this case, if you were to be successful, how it would change your life? Well, I, I think it would change my life dramatically. Um, the first time somebody said to me, are you married? And I said, yes. I would think, oh, what, that feels good. It feels good and honest and true. Um, I would feel more secure. I would feel more accepted. I'd feel more pride. I'd feel less protective of my kids. I'd feel like, less like I had to protect my kids or worry about them or worry that they feel any shame or um, sense of not belonging. So I think they're immediate, very real, and very desirable personal gains that I would experience, and of course, close family. Um, but on a different level, you know, as a parent, you're always thinking about that other generation, that next generation, because you're, they're in your house. <laughs> so you're constantly thinking about the world that you're, the society you're in. What are you doing for them? And are we building a good world for them? And 
I really want that. I want uh, our kids to have a better life than we have right now. When they grow up, I want it to be better for them. And then their kids, I want their lives to be better too. So I really do think about that generation and the possibility of having grandchildren someday and, and having them live in a world where they grow up and whoever they fall in love with, it's okay. Because they can be honored and they can be true to themselves and they can be accepted by society and protected by their government. Um, and that's what I hope can be the outcome of this case in the long run. And as somebody who's from one of those conservative little pockets of the country where there isn't necessarily a lot of difference in the types of people that are there, having those legal protections is everything. It's important for these kids that don't have ready access to all types of people to le at least feel like the option um, to be true to yourself is an option that they can have too. And that's what I hope for. I hope for something for Chris and I, but we're big, strong women. You know, we're, um, we're in a good place in our lives right now. So we would benefit from it greatly, but other people over time I think would benefit it in such a more profound, life-changing way. Thank you, Ms. Steer. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well. You may cross-examine, Mr. Rum. Very well, then, Ms. Steer, thank you for your testimony. You may step down. Very well, your next witness. Very well, 